After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When it had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to the country by another route. Um, That short clip was from the White Princess, a mini TV series that I've been um, enjoying over the last several um, weeks. It's basically uh, about the uniting of the houses of York and the house of Lancaster um, after um, Richard III loses his crown at the Battle of Bosworth. So the main theme around um, this series is the fights that go on um, for the throne of England. Who has the right to sit on the throne? Who supports their claim? And who's secretly plotting uh, against them in order to get them off um, the throne? I love it, right up my street. You see, in those days, um, there wasn't a person in the land who was disinterested about who ruled, <clears throat> whether it was peasant, page, or prince. They all knew that their lives would be affected by the king. So here's my question for you this um, evening. Who do you want to sit on the throne? Who will rule you? I'm not talking about in the series. I'm not even talking about the British um, throne and whether you think it should pass from Elizabeth um, to Charles or bypass him and go straight to William. I'm talking about your life as an individual. You as an individual, who will rule you? Who will sit on the throne of your heart. We've just sung that in one of the carols, haven't we? Loving hearts enthrone him. But notice, I didn't ask if someone or something will rule you. Let me let you into a secret. It's never a question of if you will be ruled by someone or something, but by whom will you be ruled? Each one of us are ruled in some way. We offer our service our loyalty, our affection to someone or something that has a controlling influence and power um, over us. Some of us are are ruled by family expectations and decisions. Some are ruled by our own affections and desires. That's what's number one. Some are ruled by ambition and and drive. And some are ruled by the longing to be um, loved. But all are ruled Each and every one of us is ruled by someone or something. You see, the question running through our lives is the same question that's running through that miniseries, The White Princess. Who is going to sit on the throne? And what will you do to keep him, her, or it there in its place? I wonder if you noticed as that reading was read from Matthew chapter 2, Uh, Matthew's Gospel, we have a throne um, issue. We're told that Jesus was born during the time of King Herod, but the wise men arrive saying, where is the one born King of the Jews? Well, no wonder Herod and all Jerusalem with him are disturbed. Herod sits on the throne, and these magi from the east turned up and said, where is the child who's going to sit on your throne? You see, we do get disturbed, don't we? We get disturbed when something comes and challenges the thing that we think rightfully sits on the throne. 
whatever we've determined that will be. And so in the birth narratives, in the Gospels that they're talking about Jesus being born, all these issues are raised about rule, who supports his rule, who's against his rule, what kind of ruler will he be? So here's my first question. I have three questions I want to think about this evening. Here's the first one. Does Jesus have the right to be on the throne? In The White Princess, Henry II, the Tudor king, he's plagued by Yorkist boys who claim that the throne rightfully belongs to them. Not Henry II, Henry VII, sorry. Does the baby born of the virgin... Does he have the right to sit on the throne? Yes, and here's why. He was born in the right place. Herod makes this inquiry of these religious elite, and he says, where is this child to be born that you speak of, uh, that the Magi is speaking of? And they know their Old Testament Bibles very well. They know the prophecies that have happened over the past several um, hundred years. And they say, in Bethlehem, that's where the rightful king will be born, the king that God has promised. And lo and behold, where is Jesus born? Where do his mother and father have to go as a result of the Roman census? Bethlehem. He's born in the right town, the town that the promised king will come from. But he's also born of the right town line as well. In Matthew 1, one of the other readings, did you notice that Joseph is referred to as the son of David? Well, why is that important? It's important because the king, who was to be born in Bethlehem, also had to be born of David's line. Great King David, all the promises about this king that is coming, this rescuer king, are attached to him. And Jesus is indeed of the royal line. He has every right to sit on this throne because he was born in the right place, fulfilling all the prophecies, and he was born of the right line, in the line of David. But here's the other question of huge importance. Who's backing his claim to the throne? And the answer is astounding. The creator God. This is not the lords and barons of Middle England. The creator of the whole world says that the child born in Bethlehem is the rightful ruler, not only of Jerusalem, but of the whole earth. Why do I say that? Well, there are many reasons, but I'm going to give you two. The star and the angels. When Henry VII's son, Arthur, is born to him and Elizabeth, he sends out letters with the royal seal to all the kingdom to let them know that a child has been born, an heir um, to the throne. He does everything he possibly can to alert people to the fact that a son has been born who will sit on the throne. Now, the wise men are alerted to this king's birth because of a strange star in the sky that attracted them and guided them. Now I ask you, who on earth, who on earth can mark the arrival of their son with a star in the sky? The answer, no one. No one on earth. Only the creator of the world, only the one who fashions the universe could say, look, the seal for the birth of my son, the declaration of his arrival, will be a star in the sky, not a seal on an envelope. The rightful ruler of the world, his birth will be marked by a star. God, the creator of the universe, is backing Jesus' claim to the throne. But also, when an heir to the British throne was born, It was signaled by the ringing of bells, the church bells, to announce um, the birth. Again, when Henry runs in and Elizabeth says it's a boy, he immediately says, ring out the bells, ring out the bells. The church bells must ring. How is the birth 
as this king announced? By choirs of angels. What, we must, what must we conclude if angels from heaven come to announce the arrival of this king? Surely it's that it's because this king is the king from heaven who rule not only over a small stretch of land near the Jordan River, but over the whole earth. God influenced the skies in the star, uh, the uh, stars in the sky. God influenced the angels of heaven, sending them to announce the arrival. Because He says, "I back this boy's claim to the throne of the whole earth." But here's the final question that revolves around the birth of any ruler: How do people respond? To the throne. How do people respond to the throne of Jesus? This um, question, I think, has lost its impact on us somewhat. The British media still tries to big up any royal engagement or birth. Even this week, the BBC uh, ran an article about where in line um, to the throne the, any children of Harry and Meghan would come. But whatever the media hype, we know, don't we, deep in our hearts, that it's not of huge consequence to us. If um, Henry VII wanted a castle built, he just taxed the people of Cornwall and got it built. But if Prince Charles wants a new car, in the words of Boris Johnson about the EU divorce bill, he can go whistle for it. You see, we don't really understand about demands coming from the throne because there are very few demands come from the British throne. But the reality is, friends, that wherever we place on the throne of our lives always makes demands. It will issue decrees, edicts, it will levy taxes that we have to pay, and if we don't pay them, we have to pay the consequences. Let me go back to two of those examples I gave at the beginning. If you're ruled by family expectations, then you'll have to meet those expectations in your life, if that's what rules and governs you. Or you risk being thrown into a dungeon of disappointment and self-loathing. If you're ruled by your own affections and desires, you have to make sure those affections and desires are fulfilled. That's the tax and levy that they place on your life. And if you don't pay those taxes, then you risk being consigned to a tower of disappointment and regret. All rulers issue demands from their thrones. And each and every one of us, whether we realize it or not, are ruled by someone or something. So what does Jesus demand from his throne? Worship. Worship. But the problem is we're so reluctant and unwilling to give it. There are a number of responses to Jesus's throne today and back then. I want to give you three from that um, passage in Matthew that's on the sheets. See if you can spot yourself in there. The first one is apathy. I think some people regard Jesus as kingship like we regard the British monarchy. It's fairly irrelevant, but every now and again it adds a bit of sparkle at certain times of the year. And in this reading from Matthew, that's seen in the religious leaders they hear what's said, that Herod asks them this question. He give, they give the king the information that is requested. And then they go about their business. They don't seek after the wise men, follow them, don't ask any further questions. The whole of Jerusalem and Herod are disturbed, and the religious leaders are disinterested. And I guess that is the most common response to Jesus today. People just do simply nothing about him. We come to the carol service, and then it's business as usual. Apathy. But here's the second response, and it's an angry one. The kind of person who's threatened by Jesus, that's King Herod uh, in this account. He's really afraid so much so that he lies and he schemes. 
He'll commit mass murder of young boys in order to get rid of Jesus. He's so convinced it's his right to sit on the throne and no one else's that he'll do anything possible to keep himself there. Do you know, it's extraordinary the lengths we will go to in order to hold on to self-rule. Jesus makes a claim on our lives and we just start to get a bit angry. (laughs) But here's the third response and it's the one of adoration. This kind of person hears about King Jesus and they just want to fall down and worship him. That's the wise men in this account. The wise men, they recognize the dignity of Jesus and they just fall down and worship. And in falling down, they're saying, look, you're higher and I'm lower. And then the major, it says they were filled with joy, overjoyed. See, that's what happens when the rightful ruler sits on the throne, then joy is restored. But all of the pretenders, they just take, take, and take. And the wise men in their adoration are willing to give gifts to Jesus. See, when you truly love and serve someone, parting with what is precious to you in order for what you now treasure above everything else, is the obvious thing to do. God has placed his rightful son on the throne of his world. And there are three ways you can respond to his rule. Apathy, anger, or adoration. But can I just say, as we finish, that none of those responses stops him from being king. Two of them stop you from enjoying the benefits of his rule. But it doesn't stop him ruling. And God, who's back in his claim, what do you think how he thinks of the first two responses? He said, to set yourself against Jesus, according to Matthew 2, is to set yourself against God. And I guess conspiring against the son he's appointed is not a very wise thing to do. See, we're all ruled by someone or something. The question is, have you got the rightful ruler of your life sitting on the throne?